And gentrification is something that's that's real and that's coming. And to be able to really thoughtfully develop in a way that uh, the neighbors would like. Um, I also heard people's concerns about. Um, so I, I'm committed to being your full-time representative on City Council because I believe that Rochester deserves that attention and I look forward to earning your support. I want to thank everybody for allowing me to present myself to you this evening. My name is Ann Lewis. I've lived in the Cornhill neighborhood 26 years. I'm a teacher with the Rochester City School District. I was a counselor for the jail for 16 years and the Rochester Police Department for five years. My greatest strength is being an advocate. My greatest strength is being able to listen to you, taking your wants to whomever they need to go to, whether it's city council, whether it's the police department, and presenting your voice. You will hear a lot of rhetoric today. I'm gonna to do this, I'm gonna do that. I'm an individual. I am an individual who wants to make those one-on-one -on -one contacts, relationships with you to take your concerns to the right department. You need a voice. You don't need any more rhetoric. We've had rhetoric for years and years and years. It's time to Get involved, get action. One of my strongest accomplishments that I'm very, very proud of, as I said, I live in the Cornhill Neighborhood Association. I'm on the um, Philanthropy Free Committee. I always mispronounce that word, but I worked hard to make sure we had a scholarship in memory of Ty Sean Williams, the young man who was killed in the Cornhill neighborhood. Little things like that build community. Little voices like that build community. Not the rhetoric, you have to be an advocate. You have to want to help. If you haven't had experience being an advocate, as I had in the jail, trying to make sure the inmates got their needs addressed, trying to ensure that they got to rehabs, and victim assistance, completing crime victims' compensation claims to make sure individuals got their mortgage paid or got their bills paid. In the Rochester City School District, trying to make sure that teachers implement strategically based curriculum. I'm sorry that my time is up. I hope you got a sense that I want to be your advocate, your voice. Thank you. Good evening, thank you all for allowing us this opportunity. My name is Matt Judah and I'm here to talk to you about my race for city council so that I can be your next representative. It's interesting to be in the 19th Ward tonight. My first home was actually here in 19th Ward and I got my start in neighborhood leadership right here as a member of the 19th Ward Community Association. I was actually my block representative for the Westfield neighborhood. So I understand what happens here in the 19th Ward. Um, beyond having lived in this neighborhood, I've also worked for the city school district for 13 years. Prior to that, I worked for Parks and Recreation for 10. So on a day-to-day -day basis, since the age of 16, I've worked with our neighbors and with our community, and I understand and experience through the eyes of my students and their families the challenges that every resident faces in Rochester. I've li I live in Charlotte, and I've been involved in the neighborhood up there as well. I was a vice president of the community association, I served on the Merchants Association board, and I also helped start a farm market. I understand what it takes to be a leader in a neighborhood, and I understand what it feels like to be a leader in a neighborhood that is struggling to communicate with City Hall. I am committed as a representative on City Council to bring the voices of neighbors into council chambers, to make sure that what neighborhoods want is heard and carried out in what we're doing. And I intend to do that in a very specific way, by having each economic corridor create a 10-year plan that will guide the development in those neighborhoods, not only from a business perspective in terms of the type of businesses we want, but the type of streetscapes we want, the type of um, landscape, anything that has to do with what the neighbors want to see. Because too often, we're presented with proposals that don't align with what we as a community can desire, nor what we will support. And we need to stop giving our tax money to projects that are not supported by our neighbors. So again, my name is Matt Judah, and I am hoping to earn your support this evening. Thank you.
for one of the five seats on the City Council. I'm running at the Working Families Line. Um, I appreciate your time this evening to speak with you. I am a lifelong city resident attending 17th School and School of the Arts uh, and Nazareth College. Um, I've been a, a volunteer since middle school. Uh, raised money for AIDS Rochester, which is now Trillium Health. Uh, actually have a lot of uh, deep roots here in Rochester. My own grandfather helped begin Jefferson Avenue Seventh-day Adventist Church in the 50s. Uh, I've been very inspired by my mom and uh, local leaders such as Reed Scott, who was the president of this council a year ago, and Tim Tim Means as well, who I worked with at Rapa. <clears throat> If, oh, I wanted to mention, being here in the 19th Ward, I wanted to commend the 19th Ward Community Cats for their TNR program. Um, that is really needs to be replicated, and thank you very much if anyone is here uh, who is doing that work, that hard work. It's beautiful. Um, if elected, I would like to create a fund to help pay for spay and neuter services in the city. I know that there is a reduced fee, but some people do find that to be challenging, even at the reduced rate. And really, it would help improve our uh, neighborhoods, the lives of the cats and animals uh, overall, if we could help reduce that, that population here in the city. And we could be an example for the rest of our county. Um, I'm a stay-at-home mom, so I would intend, if elected, to have this job as be my full-time job. Um, there's so many issues that the city is facing that it really needs someone atten someone's attention full time. Uh, that's what I would want to do. Um, I would uh, be very, very grateful for your support, and uh, I hope to speak with you afterwards. Again, Pam Davis, Ranked Council. Thank you very much. And then after school, I would go across the street to work at Boys and Girls Club, helping students learn how to read and helping them learn computer skills. So this is really an important place to me. Um, when I graduated from Wilson, I started my company right off of Thurston. And it's been very successful. Most of my employees live right here in the city, so I'm creating city jobs. Some people ask me why I'm running for city council. And the reason is the city has been my home my entire life. My wife and I got married last year, and naturally we're planning for children. And a lot of people come to us and say, well, you're moving to the suburbs, right? Right, you're, you're going to Gates, you're going to Greece, you're going to Penfield. That's where the better education system is. That's where there's less crime. That's where there's more jobs. That's where you want to raise your children. That's not where we want to raise our children. We want to raise our children in the city where there's awesome diversity, great people, and just wonderful um, innovation. But we don't want to feel like the city is a place where our children won't have good opportunity growing up because of the education and the crime. So we decided that I would run for city council to make that change, to push for those changes, so that the city becomes a place that people in the suburbs go, oh, we're thinking about kids, maybe we should move to the city. That's why I'm running for city council. Thank you very much. My name is Mitch Brewer. I'm running for Rochester City Council because I want to build a healthier community for everyone. Right now, zip code is a better predictor of health than genetic code. If you live in places like where I live, in the Susan B. Anthony neighborhood, 14608, a child of my neighbor, for example, is expected to live nine years fewer than a child born to parents in Pittsburgh on the same day. That is inexcusable and it's unacceptable. And it's really a byproduct of some severe public health issues. We're not talking about access to hospitals and doctors, although that's important too, especially with the dialogue going on with healthcare. But we're talking about how do we build healthier neighborhoods for people? How do we build neighborhoods where the healthy choice can be the easy choice? This is the very work I've been doing for the past nine years at Foodlink, and even prior to that as a Head Start teacher up on Hudson Avenue. And I'll give you an example right here in the neighborhood. Many years ago, I started working with St. Stephen's over on Chai Lai when they identified a need to build a community garden. And so we started that garden several years ago and that garden then blossomed into a weekly farm stand in the summer months where we're bringing fresh fruits and vegetables and eggs into the community, accepting SNAP benefits, incentivizing people to utilize SNAP benefits by connecting to federal programs. That market then turned into nutrition education courses, teaching kids, adults, parents, families, how to cook, how to eat, healthy on a budget. That's the very type of work I believe that can be translated to city council to build healthier communities. And it's not just about food. How do we build healthier neighborhoods where kids can play actively? How do we build 
streets where adults can bike to work. My philosophy is that we can't change our education rates if kids aren't feeling well. We can't change our unemployment rates if people are calling in sick every three days. Let's build a healthy city, let's be innovative. I hope to have your support to do that exact work. Thank you very much. Doing something to make this a better place for them and those who are coming behind me. I am committed to working to create job opportunities. That's sort of a baseline situation for me because I believe that a lot of what we are facing has to do with poverty and poverty is tied to income. Income is tied to employment and entrepreneurial opportunities. So I have devoted a lot of my career on council to providing those kinds of opportunities and opening doors for others. I am a small business owner, so I know what kind of trials there are about trying to create jobs for, for others, and even in trying to find employees who you can hire. So it's a double-edged sword. There's a lot of work to do in that field, and I'm prepared to do it. I am deeply committed as well to seeing a restructured civilian review board. We worked on it a couple of years ago. We got some work done. There's a lot more to do. And you have my absolute promise that that is going to happen. We are going to create a board that is transparent, accessible, and accountable. Thank you. 12th, it's great to be here in the 19th Ward. I'm standing where I am today because of the support that I got in the 19th Ward as a young person. And that's why um, a lot of my platform emanates um, upon experiences that I had as a young person. I was a youth representative on the Sector 5 uh, committee when I was a student at Wilson Magnet High School and the schematic design team that built the, that built the Madison um, campus, the new Madison campus that's there. So I have an, a, an intense understanding of how powerful neighborhoods could be, and even now in my capacity as a member of the Board of Education, working with folk in this, folks in this room to ensure that school number 16 um, uh, stayed open. Uh, is, is, is evidence of the importance of neighbors and neighbors uh, being involved. So one of the key pieces of my platform is neighborhoods. Neighborhoods are the fabric of our community. Um, we would not have a city if we don't have strong neighborhoods, so I pledge to always ensure that I'm accessible to neighbors and that we make um, sure that neighbors' voices are heard at City Hall because that is where some of the best ideas come from. Youth are extremely important to me. I know how um, I got my start as a young person, so I want to ensure that I am um, a person that is focused on youth as a city council member. If you are a grandparent or a parent or an aunt or an uncle, you know how important it is to ensure that your kids have access to good recreational opportunities, access to good jobs. All of that shows that if kids are given jobs earlier on, they make more money over the course of their lifetime, and they get better jobs as they grow. So that will be another important plank. And then lastly, I want to say um, jobs in general are extremely important. Not big jobs. We're not going to get a company that's going to bring a million people. But we need to look at small entrepreneurial um, startups to help create jobs because small companies become big companies. I always use this data point that if one in three small businesses with five or few employees created at least one job, America could be at full employment. We know that that won't happen, but it shows you the power that small businesses have in our communities to be able to be economic engines to help power our economy. In Rochester, we can always use more tax revenue as well as jobs for our people. So I look forward to um, your support and then more importantly to take your questions as we go throughout the evening. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jackie Ortiz. Um, I'm a small business owner here in the city of Rochester. I have been for the last 12 years. Um, have a family, husband, and a three-year-old child that we started in early pre-K here at school number 15 in the fall. Um, have been working very hard over the last several years as one of your current elected city council members. Um, I've worked tirelessly on amplifying the voices here in our neighborhood, not only from the standpoint of the neighborhood associations, but also from a one-on-one -on -one standpoint. I think absolutely critical that if you have a problem, that you should be able to come to your city council, and we are supposed to be as responsive as we absolutely can. Everything from what's happening with that property on my street, what about the curbs in my neighborhood, what about this development that's happening. I pride myself on being a responsive council member and finding the answers and taking us down a path that is a successful one for all of us. 
um, transparency, empowerment, things that I believe are very critical to us in this position. And when I say that, I believe if we have the information, so should, so should you. And one of the things that I've been working on very hard over the last several years is to provide as much of it as possible accessible to the public online through our site. One of the things that we just recently done, hopefully you saw that, we passed legislation on Tuesday to be able to, what I'm calling improve neighborhoods by providing um, accessible information regarding those investor owned properties. Right? We have some good ones, but we have some not so good ones. And we need to be able to figure out how we reach out to one another and actually work collaboratively on how to deal with the issues. So that'll be rolling out. You'll also see some new information. We get questions all of the time. You know, we've called on this one, nothing's happening. You'll see a new nuisance tab that's listed on there that provides you with more information on properties. Small businesses, I am one, currently working on an opportunity to connect small businesses and provide a level playing field for bidding opportunities on our city contracts. Changing the language to also provide guidance for a selection of subcontractors. Not everybody can be a GC, but we can help each other. And I'm going to continue to work on those things. Would absolutely appreciate your support. Good evening, everyone. All right, my name is Willie Joe Lightfoot. I'm running for city council at large, and I'm asking for your support. I want to thank you, first of all, for supporting me all down through these years as your county legislator. Why I am running? Because of you. You are the reason why I am running. You guys came to me when I was a county legislator, and you asked for us to reduce farmer market fees. It was a task that seemed like it was impossible with a Republican-ran majority county legislature and a minority that, we were, that I was in at the time. You need somebody that's gonna listen to you. I prove it that I will listen to you. I prove it that I will fight for you in odds that seem impossible. We got the farmer market changed. Remember, we reduced the farmer market fees, which opened up farmer markets for across Monroe County, not only for West Side, but across the whole Monroe County. We did that together. That took the type of leadership that I want to continue to bring at the city council, which is all Democrats, so we can get a lot more done as an all Democratic platform. So that's one of the reasons why, because I love working for you. I'm a lifelong Democrat. I live in the 19th Ward. I raised all my children, went to school here locally. All my children are grown now. I'm getting ready to retire from the fire department. I want to be a full-time person working for you at city council. That's why I'm running. Public safety, economic development. Go to my website, www.willylifewood.com. My resume is over here. All of my information about my platform, the pillars, but I don't like giving out platforms. I learned that in county legislature, because you make all these promises, then you find out bureaucracy and a lot of things, you can't get it done. So my first 100 days in office, I'm gonna hold a forum just like this. And we're gonna come up with our own attack of what we're gonna do year by year, and then we're gonna implement, and then we're gonna go back see how our progress is, and we're gonna do it together. So that's the kind of leadership that I wanna bring. We've done it before, and we can continue to do it. God bless you, and thank you. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, I think everybody probably knows who I am. I'm David Miller. I'm currently Vice President of Rochester City Council. I also am the chair of the Business and Economic Development Committee, and I am running for re-election to City Council. Uh, I come here tonight to humbly ask for your vote. Uh, as I look around this room, I see essentially my, my neighbors. Um, most of the people in this room I, I live with, work with, have spent lots of time with. I'm a lifelong resident of Southwest Rochester, growing up on the other side of Jefferson Avenue, but I've been in the 19th Ward this year will be 40 years that I've lived in the 19th Ward. So my wife Rita and I raised our two sons here. And the reason that I am so passionate about what we do here is because I love this city. I love Rochester. I love the 19th Ward. And, and most of you know I served as president of the 19th Ward Community Association twice. So uh, I've also served on city council for a while, not quite as long as your district council member. But, but nearly as long as your district council member. I'm actually the second longest serving member uh, who will be uh, remaining on council. And uh, as being uh, on council for quite so long, I have worked across multiple administrations and multiple councils. I've chaired almost every committee on city council, finance, jobs, parks, and public works, economic development, uh, neighborhood development. And you know the thing that, that most people will say about me, and it will be true, is, I'm not going to be the loudest voice in the room. I'm not going to be the guy standing up on the table. 
Uh, I'm going to be the guy that is working to build consensus, to find a way to get things done, and to make sure that um, we, we build bridges across issues, across people, and across boundaries. Um, I really uh, look forward to working more on economic development. Most of you know the work that has been done in Brooks Landing. A lot of you know the work that's been done on Thurston. And you know the work that's going to be done at Bullshead. And I look forward to having your support to continue that great work. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming here tonight. We really appreciate you inviting us. My name is Tom Hasman, also one of the candidates for City Council. Uh, grew up in the area, was, uh, uh, went to uh, SUNY Oswego, got my degree in political science. Was lucky enough to get an internship in the White House in Washington, D.C., so I packed my bags and moved to D.C. And then lucky enough to get a job in the White House, so I ended up working in the Clinton White House for three years. So I've got a good policy government background. After 10 years in D.C., my wife and I missed Rochester, so we moved back. We were ready to start our family. And we uh, settled into the ABC Streets neighborhood in Cobbs Hill. And before I knew it, people had found out about my community and government experience, and I was asked to lead the neighborhood association. So I ended up becoming president of ABC Streets for four years. Uh, we did a lot of neighborhood building, a lot of community building. In 2013, after four years, I thought I was going to retire. But uh, Nancy Johns Price, who is the leader of the Neighborhood Service Center in Southeast, worked with me a lot and saw a lot of the work that I had done. And she said, I would like your help to help other neighborhood associations. So I've been still very active uh, helping other neighborhood associations, either brand new, get off the ground, or dormant ones, little things you take for granted about making sure you have bylaws, insurance, so you don't get sued. In fact, um, uh, one of An uh, Andrew's um, workers, I just met with him this morning, he's over in the pocket and they're trying to get things going over there. So one of my ideas is to have neighborhood plans. Last week we were in Charlotte and as I was driving there, it dawned on me, it took almost a half an hour to get up to Charlotte and we were still in the city. Think about that for a second, how far you can drive in half an hour. So we have a big city population wise and geographic wise. So each neighborhood has different needs. If I'm elected, I would love to work with neighborhoods and come up with neighborhood plans for each neighborhood. Um, thanks again for coming tonight and look forward to your questions this evening. Hello, how's everyone doing this evening? You okay? All right, can you hear me back there? Okay, I wanna make sure everyone's okay. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Sean Dunwoody. I'm running for uh, city council at large. And I'm, I've always wanted to be and always have been active in the community, working with young folks in this area. I've had the opportunity and the blessing to work with many of you in this room to actually shape the environment and the world that we see around us. And that's what I want to bring to City Council, a design way of thinking. How do we view something completely differently, to approach it differently, and get different and new results? I'm a native of Rochester. I love this city. I've raised my three children here, and now I run around the city with my four grandchildren, uh, which is a great feeling. Uh, yes, I am a grandpa. Uh, <laughs> and it is great to be here uh, in, the, in the 19th Ward. Uh, younger, in my younger years, I used to go to the movie theater and watch karate movies uh, every Saturday. And that's what inspired me to want to be a real life hero. And so that's what I want to do. I bring that leadership to young people, to mentor them, not only to guide them along, but I love to produce young people who become future leaders in our community. This is the things that I want to be able to accomplish for you, listening with you here uh, on City Council. I've worked on projects from creating um, a memorial mural on uh, Gardner Rec Center uh, for TJ Works. And that actually spurred movements to improve city recreation, painting the courts, getting young people engaged. Uh, had the pleasure of working on, on the corner of Brooks and Genesee, working with neighborhood residents to spread a message about doing good on the Hibbot House in this neighborhood. So I, I want to work with you, build with you, and create with you the world that we need to see for ourselves and for our generations to come so that our children and our children's children will, will reap the benefits of what we do today. Thank you very much for your time. Hello everybody, good evening. My name is Marcus Williams. How many people here love Rochester? Anybody? Yeah, me too. All right. I grew up on this side of town, right up the street, right on Arnett and Thurston. 
boom, right there. That's me in a nutshell, okay? And there's a lot of stuff that everybody wants to do for the city here tonight. Everybody's got pretty great ideas, and everybody believes that they're the best candidate for the position. However, there are five seats available. All I'm asking you guys for is your vote for me, okay? <laughs> everybody else has a vote for themselves, okay? Because my goal is to actually get some action accomplished for Rochester and for our community, for each district and every district. That's why I'm glad that I'm able to run as a city council member at large. That means that I can help the whole city. And even though I live in the Southwest, it means that I don't have to focus on this quadrant. Now there's a lot of stuff that I wanna get done, so I'm not gonna hold up the microphone talking too much. So I'm gonna try to hit a couple of hot pots real quick. So number one is our educational system. It's crumbling, everybody knows it. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. We need to restructure it from the ground up. The problem isn't the schools, the problem is what's being taught and what's being encouraged. The kids aren't being encouraged to learn what's coming up. The future technologies, the future math, future sciences, and to develop for the future. They need to graduate earlier so that they can move on, so that they can advance better than other places in the country. In our city, we have a serious infrastructure problem. Everybody knows about the potholes. Potholes, anybody? <laughs> exactly, let me not make any jokes about them, but it just shows how little the city actually pays attention to us as citizens. Okay, and that's in all different frames of work. Now, I've got a card up here, got a couple seconds left. I just hope you guys will give me some time, look me up on Facebook, it's Marcus C. Williams, and hear all my positions and where I stand, because I'm here to take action for you. Because that's what you deserve, and that's what our city deserves. Thank you guys. <laughs> My name is Chris Eads. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's good that I'm, I'm following you here because um, you know, when, when people ask me why I'm running for city council, and, and I like to say, you know, have, have you noticed how, how bad our roads are in the city? Right? Why, why do you think they're in such poor repair? And it's the same reason that uh, we're cutting back on hours for our libraries, we're cutting back on funding recreation centers, and it's the same reason that many of our neighborhoods are falling into disrepair. Uh, we give out millions of dollars in corporate welfare in this city in terms of subsidies, tax breaks, reciprocal agreements to large corporations and wealthy developers. Um, and in the meantime, we don't have money for basic things like road repair. Um, in addition, uh, we actually receive grants from the federal government based on uh, the neighborhoods that we have that where people live in poverty. But there's no requirement that we spend that money on those neighborhoods. Instead, we put that money in the general fund and we direct it um, towards uh, wealthier neighborhoods and uh, you know this sort of uh, corporate welfare instead. Uh, and, and you know what? It's, it's not an accident. Uh, when you look at who, who gives the campaign contributions, you can see a direct connection. Wealthy people have money to give to politicians and they get favors in return. And I've, I've been in politics for a long time. I've seen this happening for a long time, and I'm tired of it. And if you elect me to city council, I'll put a stop to it. Thank you. Hey, everyone. I'm Anthony Giordano, and I'm a lifelong resident of Rochester. I've been involved with many community organizations and initiatives all over the city. And I want to bring, and people who know me know I work very hard and I'm very neat and meticulous, and so I want to bring those qualities here to this neighborhood. I feel that Rochester's a great place to live, but there are some things that could be done better, differently, and um, I feel it's, it's time for a change. I have nothing personal against any of the incumbents, but I feel it's, it is time for a change. Um, part of what I do is if, if, if I have the pleasure of being elected is that um, if you call me, I will come out and see you and um, I'll just do more with community a, a service. Um, it's not a requirement, it's, it's city council's considered a part-time job, but I would consider it being a part, a full-time job. I would put more time, and um, also I'm concerned with crime, and I feel that when we 
we need a, a, a new civil uh, uh, police review board, but the key word is a citizen cons uh, police review board. Because right now, that's the key thing that's missing, is that it's the different layers of the police, and um, uh, we could do, we could really improve that, improve the relationship between the police and the youth, um, broaden the communication between the two, so we would have better relationships. And thank you very much, and I appreciate your support. I'm not in the primary. I'll be on a general election ballot in November 7th. And if you like me, please remember me in November. Thank you. Thank you to all the candidates for putting their hearts on their sleeves and telling us what we would do for us. I don't know if you all candidates noticed, but I hope my students take as copious notes as the audience. So please think as you answer these questions. The first two people who will answer questions tonight will be Marcus Williams and Mitch Gruber. We did a random selection and those are the first two names called. So Marcus should need a mic and Mitch will need a mic. And the question is, 60 seconds, you have to answer it. You each should have one rebuttal card. If you want to use 60 seconds to rebut it, you have to use your rebuttal card. In light of the role that the lack of affordable housing plays in poverty, what ideas do you have for the council that could balance free market rents and government rent controlled housing markets? Well, Free market rents in this city are going up and increasing at an uh, exponential rate. And most of it's due to the projects that we've decided to build downtown. Now, I didn't have any choice in all these luxury developments downtown, and I'm sure if any of you guys had any say in it, a lot of them wouldn't have been built. And it's contributing greatly to that. We need to do something and step in. We need to put a moratorium on all of these luxury developments. We also need to start putting in action some plans to develop affordable housing for actual working people because there is some for people who are on subsidized incomes and stuff like that but for actual working class people there's not very much at all we can actually turn this city around if we focus on developing out our resources that we have people that are working class and people that want to get to work that are low income we need to encourage job placement for people that need jobs, and we need to encourage more urban renewal for the working class. Thank you, guys. Excuse me. When I started this program, the curbside market at Food Link about five years ago, the sole purpose was to get into more of the affordable housing communities and make sure that folks had a chance to eat fresh and healthy food. I've seen the vast majority of affordable housing communities in this city, and I'll tell you, we have some wonderful Rochester Housing Authority sites, and we have some ones that need a whole lot of work. No, no questions asked, there has to be some improvements done to the existing stock of affordable housing, and without question, we need to make sure the developments that come down the pipe are also married with some more affordable housing options. There is a shortage in the city. We also have an incredibly long wait list for Section 8. And on top of that, we have so many of the landlords in the city that will not take Section 8. And we have to have a well-developed plan for how to make sure that folks who are trying to get ahead in life and trying to make sure that they have a stable place to live are able to do so. I can tell you I've done incredible amounts of research on the impact that poverty has on the city, just like Act Rochester does. We've done some similar work at Foodlink, and there's no question that rent is always the first thing. It eats people's income. We have got to be smart about making sure that folks who are trying to work hard have an opportunity to live affordably and safely. Thank you. See no rebuttal cards going up, so next two respondents are Mary Lupin and Chris Eads. For Mary and Chris. And your question is, how would you best engage with citizens after the election is over? Yeah, 
How would you best engage with citizens after the election is over? Yeah, you all don't need to turn the mics off each time. Just leave them on, please. Okay, my name is Mary Lupian. That's a really great question because it's a valid criticism that you see politicians coming to your door during election time and then you don't see them afterwards. And I think that's a fundamental breakdown in the connection between government and, and people in the neighborhoods. I think that we should be use, utilizing the Democratic Party, which has 1,200 committee members, and we're each assigned a few blocks. We should be using those people to be knocking on doors outside of election time, to spread information, to uh, get feedback from the community, to pass along into the government, because we can't just be coming to people at election time and asking them what they need and then not coming back. And there's a lot of information that comes out of the city that doesn't get disseminated into the neighborhoods because people can't come to a, a forum on Monday night at six o'clock, people have work. So how can we get into the neighborhoods and get more feedback? And I believe that it's face-to-face -face contact all the time. Thank you. Yes, well, I'm, uh, I'm not running in the Democratic primary. I'm gonna appear in the general election on the uh, Libertarian Party and Reform Party line. So I know the odds are against me in this election. Uh, but I, I don't intend to stop here. Um, as, as you may have gathered from what I've said previously, um, I've been interested in politics in this city for a long time, and I understand that if we're going to have real change, we need to build a long-term movement. Um, so I'm not going to stop after the election. I'm not going to stop talking to people. I'm not going to stop knocking on doors. Um, I may be uh, running again uh, two years from now in uh, the district election for city council. So I'm, I'm in this for the long term, and I'm, I'm looking to help build a movement in our community. That's two respondents. Tom Hassman, Pam Davis. Please remember if you'd like to say something, follow up, rebut to the, the previous question, just hold your card up. The next question for Tom Hassman is, what are your thoughts on the civilian review board? Uh, Hello? Okay, there we go. Um, I actually work in the security field and cybersecurity, and I'm 100%, thank you, behind the uh, Citizen Review Board. In my field, we have a concept called separation duties. Man, this microphone's not doing too good, is it? We have a concept called separation of duties in my field, and that is, as a security person, I cannot audit myself. Someone else needs to audit my work. And while we have uh, many officers that are very honest, it is extremely important that there is an independent body. When you have something happen, you cannot have the chief of police deciding what's gonna happen to the officer at work um, in the police department. So I can tell you hands down, I'm 100% behind um, the review board. And when I went for my endorsement view um, in front of the uh, union, they definitely did not like that answer, so I was not surprised when I did not get endorsed. But again, I have the uh, citizens' interests at heart, and that is fair and something we definitely need in Rochester and is long. And if I get a, uh, elected to council, I will definitely push for that to become law. Thank you. We may want to part <laughs> Good evening, Pam Davis. <clears throat> My thoughts on the Civilian Review Board. As a citizen who was greeted at my own door to four or five officers with guns drawn in my own driveway, uh, only to be laughed at because I was so shocked that I started to cry, uh, I support the Civilian Review Board 110%. Uh, we as a community, we do support our police force, but we don't know, uh, or I'm sorry, we do know that there are some officers that aren't using their authority with the best of intentions. These officers should not be allowed to remain in the department. I am very glad that we have the body cameras in use here in the city. Uh, this will help protect both the citizens as well as the police officers and help to alleviate any mistaken recollection of order of interactions between all parties. Um, I would also like our police officers to live in our city, uh, to see our city residents as neighbors and friends uh, rather than random, faceless others. Thank you. Lewis would like to respond. Good evening again. My name is Ian Lewis. Yes, we need a police accountability board. However, we need binding 
binding consequences because you can go and do all the investigation, write up your report, and then if nothing's gonna happen with that port, you're just a waste, you're just wasting people's time. We need a board that says, you were wrong, this is the consequence. I, I really feel strongly against, and maybe some people say, oh, you can't do that, police officers, when it appears very strongly that they violated a person's civil rights and they go on leave and they pay them. If you need to go on leave, if you did something, do not get paid, we'll hold that money for you. And if you're found innocent, then you got a big check coming. Thank you. Next two respondents will be uh, Mr. Hollister and Mr. Giordano. Your question is, what role do you see for city council as it relates to the safety, health, and wellness of the children of Rochester? All right. This is, uh, all right, one of the largest detractors of health that I see in our city is our extreme poverty. Rochester is ranked in the top five in the nation for extreme childhood poverty. How do we fix poverty? We need to focus on jobs to lift people out of poverty and education. If elected, I would work with the school board to work on getting financial literacy classes back into schools so kids don't end up starting their adulthood in debt. I would work with the school board to build tradesmanship programs so that kids can start in their sophomore year working with small businesses in the city and graduate at age 18 with work experience, two years of industry experience, job ready. So if you want to increase the health in the city, give people jobs so they can afford to be healthy. Thank you. concern is that, in fact, one of my planks is education. Even though I'm not running for the school board, there's a lot of things that can be improved with the city school district. Um, as far as safety, which I said, we need to um, get the youth and the police together to have discussions, to have better relations, to be more comfortable with each other as far as health. We need to make sure that we have, we put in place what's going to help people of lower incomes so that they don't go out without, they don't go without the health care that they need and they should have. And also with the wellness, that too, there's a lot of things that um, we just have problems within the city some neighborhoods could be a lot cleaner that could be some way of helping the health of kids thank you yes i too agree with the, the job part of helping the parents because of course if we're helping the parents then we're helping the children but one of the things that i think they're uh, kind of get a little missed when it comes to dealing with health Health, wellness, and safety. I've been a firefighter for 20 years. I do a program called Cut the Violence. I do free haircuts for kids. I've been doing it for 12 years. I talk to these young people. Um, uh, thousands of young people I've talked to down the last 12 years. That have, that's the biggest thing that's missing, in my opinion, that we can do a better job in city council as leaders. We don't. These kids don't feel like they're getting enough opportunity and forms to be talked to. We talk at them or they hear from us. A lot of them don't even talk to each other anymore because of social media and texting and all that. We have to create opportunities to hear from the young people. A lot of traumatized situations happen among our young people. We have to provide those opportunities to let them answer some of their own questions and their own needs by asking them and making them sure that they have a place at the table. One of, the, one of the issues that, that most interests me that Council can handle is, uh, is right-sizing the city. We have so many vacant lots, 
over where I live in the Susan B. Anthony neighborhood, over where you live here in the 19th Ward, those vacant lots negatively impact the safety, the health, and the wellness of every community they're in. We have huge opportunities to think about how we build smart things in those neighborhoods, in those vacant lots, pardon me. We have opportunities to build gardens. We have opportunities to build nature play spaces. We have opportunities to attract small scale, low impact investment by thinking about deliberately, purposefully landscaping vacant lots. This work has been done in cities like Detroit. It's been done in cities like Cleveland. And if they can do it, there's absolutely nothing stopping us from beautifying our neighborhoods and creating vibrant spaces that can lead to job training. How many people oftentimes in the suburbs are hiring young kids to do landscaping for them? We can't find the opportunities to do job training here on our vacant lots for those kids. Those are easy, impactful solutions that we can bring by thinking about ha what's happening in other Rust Belt cities and bringing them right here to Rochester. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to address that issue of uh, safety and wellness for the young people. This is something I've spent uh, uh, 30 plus years of my life doing. So can you hear me if this microphone goes out? Okay, can I place it down for just a moment? Thank you. All right. Uh, that's actually been my calling. That is my work. That is what I do is making sure that our young people are engaged, are safe. Uh, one thing that we can actually use are our recreation centers. They are actually a hub where we can, we can start uh, filling them with healthier meals. We can engage with them with healthier play. We can move things along so that they are engaged and feel safe. Those are exact safe zones. Sometimes they have a better handle on where our young people are than maybe other, uh, the district itself might know where our kids are at certain points in time. Let's use the facilities that we have. Our library system is a great place to build healthier minds as well as body. I just worked on a, a play, uh, an active play area, reading area at Phyllis Wheatley Library. This can be done as low, in, low, low cost, high impact movement. We also can have our kids within our rec centers with healthy financial processes. Products like BizKids that actually happens with the city of Rochester, teaching young people how to manage businesses and how to become entrepreneurs. So we have facilities in place, let's build upon them, make them stronger and support our children and make our future bright. Thank you. So our, our teens in the, in, the, in the neighborhood, we, we have an exciting program in, in this neighborhood called Teen Empowerment. And we see that it's, it's not just employing teens to do landscaping work, and that's important at that level, but to employ teens to do important work in their neighborhood where they feel engaged and an active member of our community. And they're not just improving their, themselves, they're helping the entire community at the same time. And Teen Empowerment only receives $25,000 from the city. And it's not a lot in commensurate with what the impact that it has on our teens. And I I substitute teach and I've, I've, taught, with, I've taught some of these, these teens and I, I see their potential. And it's absolutely critical that we expand that program and the city do what we can. They are looking to expand to three sites, so two more sites around the city, and especially in my neighborhood in Beachwood, where we're, it's a targeted impact in our neighborhood where we've got the Armappi there. We absolutely need teen empowerment there as well. Should the mayor control schools? Explain. <laughs> oh, I can't just say no. <laughs> I'm going to say no because the, um, the situation with the educational system is such that it requires the full unadulterated attention of, of, a, of a chief elected or a chief appointed. The city does a lot of things very well and although at one time I thought that of um, mayoral control was probably better than what we had. I no longer hold that opinion just because I'm looking at the way the, the whole system is moving and I really am very much concerned with the fact that we need to have someone whose only job is to lead the district. No. <laughs> Again, my name is Ann Lewis. Um, the question is, do I believe that the mayor should control the city school district? To give a good response and know what I'm talking about, I did a little research. 
and research says if there's mayor control, meaning the mayor appoints the board, the elected officials who are on school board now, you don't vote on them. They appoint it. Research shows that it doesn't make a difference. You know what makes a difference with our education process? Our parents need to discipline their children. They need to discipline their children so the children can practice delayed gratification. The children can make right decisions, not to hang out with their peers. The children can make right decisions to save some of their money. The children can make the right decision to go back into the community and work. Mayor control, well my answer is no, will not help. It's about the parents, it's about commitment to your child, it's about disciplining your child, teaching your child respect. Thank you. Mr. Williams. That's all right. Okay, so, absolutely not, all right? But the main issue with the city school district is the people on the board for the city school district, not all of them have graduated or even gone to Rochester City Public Schools. My first act as a legislator on city council would be to propose legislation that anybody that is on the school board has to have graduated from a Rochester City High School. So that way, they know what it's about they can already understand some of what's going on. On top of that, I would like them to institute a review of things that are working and are not working each year. So this way we can have continued improvement amongst our students and amongst our schools, because that's what's important, that we move forward. And in order to move forward, we need to know what's going wrong and what's going right. Thank you guys. Marcus Williams. So uh, I'm a policy guy. I got my master's degree at Johns Hopkins in government when I was down in the D.C. area. And I can tell you it's really easy to jump on the bandwagon. I remember this came up when Mayor Duffy was mayor. It's really easy to scapegoat and jump on the bandwagon, but I can tell you from a policy perspective, it's a disaster. And the reason is, is we all love our democracy. It can be so frustrating, right? When you have a president, you have a House and a Senate, it seems like nothing gets done. But on the flip side, if you give too much power to one individual, let's say the mayor, and you may have great intentions, and let's say for, the, for that mayor it's the best thing in the world, but then, right, people move on, you elect a new mayor. And let's say that you may not like what that new mayor is doing. Well, now you've, you've set a precedent and you've given too much control and too much power to one person. So from a policy, policy perspective, as frustrating as democracies are, that's one of the geniuses of a democracy is no one individual has too much power and you definitely do not want one person having all that power. Tom Hasman, thank you for the question. Ms. Pond, this is, is Melissa Pond. Um, question. How would you respond to legislation proposed to council that addresses a community problem but restricts the civil liberties of us all? I would go for it. I, I am absolutely um, in favor of civil liberties, particularly with um, the president we have now. Um, <laughs> it would be hypocritical of me to vote for anything that uh, restricts um, a person's civil liberties. I, I, I believe that that is absolutely critical. And you have to balance the two, right? So you have to, obviously we want safe streets, but I'm not gonna have, uh, be in favor of anything like stop and frisk. Right. Because that is a violation of someone's um, civil liberties as far as I'm concerned. Because you're looking at someone, and particularly as an African-American male, I can tell you with all of the challenges that I already have in my life as an educated African-American male, it's even 10 times as, as, as harder for some of the other ones where, um, Perceptions are made about them. So, so I use that as an example of a, a stop and frisk policy as an example because that's one that you hear a lot about and that we've had in the most progressive state in, uh, in the country, New York. We had it in New York City. Um, so something like that I would be adamantly um, opposed, opposed to. We cannot give up our civil liberties. We cannot give those up. Because the minute those goes, we, we, we go into 
a um, autocracy, and I'm not in favor of that. Hello, my name is Dorian Hall, and again, uh, the reason why I'm wearing this hat is because there's like 16 candidates here, and I want to be, set myself to be a different candidate. <laughs> um, I also would not support something like that. Uh, the reason being is because obviously I've also experienced some things as an African-American uh, young man in Rochester, so I would not support um, exactly, I, I got a, I guess an easy answer, I wouldn't support it, sorry, thank you. Next respondents will be Mr. Dunwoody and Mr. Judah. <laughs> if the city has $100,000 in grant money to spend in whatever way it needs to, what would be your priority? Mr. Dunwoody. $100,000, um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a great deal to work with. Uh, one of my priorities would be uh, youth and in particular uh, teen pregnancy prevention. Uh, we can tell that uh, Agent Orange, uh, number 45, has actually cut that funding. And being a, a young parent, a teenage parent, I understand that uh, it's actually a road to poverty. I was in poverty as a teenage parent. So supporting these programs can actually help uh, as far as attacking poverty issues and help the health of our young people here in the city of Rochester. I've had the pleasure to work on such a program to reduce uh, the HIV rates that affect young people ages 13 to 24 here in the city of Rochester. And working with these young people, developing campaigns, literature, billboards, music videos, anything that we could to get the message out, we were able to decrease the rate by 55%, which was phenomenal. The state was wondering, how in the world did you do that? It was because of mentorship and engagement with young people and creating new young leaders to spread the message to the peers. Thank you. All right, so $100,000 is a little bit less than 50 cents per resident. What I would do is I would take that money, I would divide it among our four quadrants. And I would have our neighborhood service centers, which are supposed to be the first line for residents to contact when they have concerns in their neighborhood. And what I would have those neighborhood service centers do is something that they have done in the Northwest Park recently, is they do community outreach, where they bring different services, DES, the police, the fire department, into a common area, and they host an event for the neighbors. We hear all and over and over that there's not communication between city hall and neighborhoods. We know that that's an issue, but this is one avenue in which we can actually bring city hall to the neighborhoods, provide services right in that event, and connect neighbors with the service providers in their area. And Ms. Scott would like to follow up. I would take that money, every dime of it, and devote it to a program like, uh, it's called KIOS. It's Concentrated Comprehensive Employment Opportunity Service, or something like that. Anyway, it's a program for people who are coming out of the criminal justice system, out of jail. Because you know, you can lock them up, but they're coming back sooner or later. And if we don't find some way of helping people to transition into being productive citizens, they're going to be right back where they were in your neighborhood. We have got to face it. We've got to work with them. We've got to do better than we're doing now. Kiosk will help bridge that part where people come out with a record and can't get a job, can't even get an interview, even though we adopted uh, a legislation that says, uh, uh, drop the, ban the box, drop the box, ban the box, which means you're not supposed to ask. But we know how that goes. We have to find ways of helping to reintegrate these folks back into our society, back into community. That's what the $100,000 can do. It'd be worth a lot more if you turn it over two or three times with these folks. Hello again, my name is Dorian Hall. What I would do with that money is I would divide that money up like stocks and bonds. I would basically divide the pie up and make sure everyone receives a piece of the pie. Um, the reason why I said it's because I've been working with neighborhood, many neighborhoods and the organization is called Many Neighbors Building Neighbors. And one of the things when we're talking is the ABC streets needed money for banners, but the Maplewood Street needed money for 
uh, helping them understand because they had a very diverse community of immigrants and the Plex needed money and Plex neighborhood needed money for um, doing uh, street work and helping the youth. So I would basically cut that money up and divide it like a pie and make sure everyone receives a piece of the pie just like if you were doing stocks and bonds. Stocks and bonds, you make more money when you diversify. When you put all your money in one bag, you tend to take big chances. I would spend the money by breaking it up, making sure everyone has a piece of the pie. Thank you. Pam Davis again. I would invest that $100,000 into creating a clean energy employment program, putting solar panels and wind turbines on owner-occupant houses, and giving apprentice trade jobs to our city's best untapped resource, its people, especially those ages 16 to 26, for whom college perhaps wasn't the right path. I want Rochester to be a leader in the renewable energy market and help our local economy grow by employing our city residents for these green, environmentally responsible jobs, which will enhance our city's future for my child and yours. I would collaborate with local nonprofits and with local home improvement stores, supplies companies, uh, to find additional funds and grants needed to do this on a grand scale. But I do know that we would start one house at a time, uh, learning better practices and efficiencies as we go. This clean energy employment program would be investing that $100 into our city and into its people. That should be the focus of our city council. Pam Davis, thank you. Our next respondents are uh, Willie J. Lightfoot and Mr. Dana Miller. Identify one idea that you have that would speed the rate of development in the city. One idea that I would do uh, that would uh, speed the rate of development in the city, I would work on ways to expedite building permits, okay? That's one of the ways, as well as reevaluating uh, the American tax funding. Um, they're selling our third party tax liens to a third party. I think that that's causing underdevelopment, it's causing people to lose their businesses, lose their properties. Uh, so that's what I would do. I would work on ways to expedite building permits, and I would also reevaluate the sale of our tax liens to a third party. Thank you. Uh, Dana Miller again running for re-election. Uh, I don't think there's anybody here that knows more about how long development projects take than I do. I've been 22 years working on Brooks Landing from the time I started working on it to the time we broke ground. So development projects, it seems, always take 20 years in Rochester. It doesn't matter what it is. And part of the reason for that is that we have so many steps and so many hurdles and so many hoops that people have to jump through that it's very, very difficult. I would really like to work with our administration to have them put together you know, more of a one-stop shop and ideally a, a person, almost like a concierge or a, a person who would walk people through the development steps so that they can get through the steps much more quickly, get through the funding, get through the zoning, get through the building permits and make sure that they have everything lined up so that when it comes for approvals, everything's done but the important thing they can't forget is it has to go before the neighbors and that's the critical thing that we keep finding on many of our development projects is that the neighbors have not had a chance to weigh in and because of that development projects get stalled so we got to make sure the neighbors involved and, and i think that's a critical step thank you Thank you, uh, Andrew Hollister. You know, development doesn't need to be big. Development can be small. It can be neighborhood-based. And uh, somebody who currently sits on city council said last week that our city places an undue burden on our small businesses, making it extremely difficult for them to be successful. I believe the easiest part of starting your business should be working with government. Right now, the hardest part of getting into business and getting your project done is city government. So what I would work on is making a simpler zoning code, and I would look at neighborhoods that have really successful development and mixed use. Park Ave, East Ave, Monroe. The zoning there is totally different than the zoning in our poorest neighborhoods. We need to loosen this up, and we need to make it so that it's easy to start and it's easy to improve your neighborhoods. Thank you. 
Okay, one of the neighborhood associations I was a member of is the Park Meds Neighborhood Association. And if any of you are familiar with the, uh, the old Genesee Hospital project, well, we had a meeting, we had the whole committee over at Buckingham Properties, and they, um, they gave us our uh, presentation. We overwhelmingly said, that's great. We want, we approve that project. Now, if you go down Alexander uh, any time today, whenever, um, you'll find that the north part of the campus is still vacant. It's just one big, grassy, vacant lot. So I, all I wanted to say was that don't blame the neighbors as to why a project takes a long time, because the neighbors are there. Now, sometimes the neighbors tell them what they want, and yet they go ahead and do their own thing anyway. They don't listen to the neighbors. So I say don't blame the neighbors. Because thank you. Project, thank you. Ms. Ortiz. Okay, so this is all yours. What, if anything, can the council do to lessen disparity between neighborhoods? So I think there are a couple of different opportunities. One of the things that I would absolutely like us to uh, do less of is because there are such finite resources, there should be no opportunities for us to be able to have neighborhoods compete against one another. There are a number of programs, although well-intentioned, um, very many times put neighborhood up against neighborhood and we're having to compete for those finite resources. So one of the things that when you do have that, which we do, um, I think we should be working on a collaborative process to be able to develop a list of priorities. And I think all of us understanding the variety of different issues that we have, that we can all come together and define which one is number one, which one is number two, to figure out our most pressing issues and work on developing and which should happen first. So no competition would be number one. The other opportunity I think is important is that we, and I've asked for this before, and I think we're getting there, but we're still not there yet, is really to take a look at our city budget, not from the standpoint of departments and the way which we do, but by quadrants. How much of the dollars per se go to this particular area when you take a look at the different types of funding that goes on, as opposed to just from a department basis. I don't think you get an accurate picture that way. And one of the things that, that, that I would love to be able to do is something that Detroit did. Um, they, they call it pink zoning. And you know, zoning is usually red tape, so pink means you make it a little lighter, which means that you change the regulations that you do um, depending on what's going on in the neighborhood. So if you have a vacant lot or you have a property that has been dilapidated for a long period of time, you lessen the regulations and uh, the regulations and zoning um, type that you had to make it easier for some type of development to go in there to get it back on the tax rolls and to get it up and working and being strong in the community. So I think we have to be um, innovative because a need on um, Holly Street, right, it might be different than a need that's on um, Barrington or Park. So you have to look at neighborhoods um, specifically and tailor it to their needs. You cannot look at it um, across the board. So um, that approach will allow us to really uplift all, um, all neighborhoods. Because we can't forget about Hudson, Hudson, Hudson Avenue, right? We can't forget about a lot of the places that you don't hear about or read about in the newspaper. And by doing that, I think that that will allow us to have um, more equality um, across all of our neighborhoods. Okay. Um, hi, Dana Miller again. Um, this disparity is a, is a real big deal. We have worked very hard in the city through things like our fo focused investment strategy to try and, and push the money in areas where it's most needed. There was a comment made earlier about funds that we receive and they don't get used in the right places. That's that's badly not true. We receive money that's called CDBG, Community Development Block Grant money. It can only be used in low income areas. So, so we do use that money where it belongs, but it's not enough. And we know that our federal government is trying to reduce that amount of money even now. So it's already not enough, it's gonna be less than not enough. So we have to work harder as a city to make sure that we're moving our resources in a way that allows us to help. And one of the biggest challenges we have in the challenged neighborhoods is the quality of the housing. 
So we have a roofing program that we've put in place that is helping people put roofs on their houses. But we need more. We need to help rebuild and, and uh, restructure and rehab the housing in our most challenged neighborhoods so the people who are living there in what is currently affordable housing for them is not only affordable housing but high quality housing. So we have to continue working on that. As a member of the Rochester Land Bank Corporation, I've worked very hard to do that and we rehab almost 100 homes in the city. So we continue to do that. Thank you. So in an effort to decrease disparity in education, we created a system-wide busing program. In doing this over the past 40 years, we've actually created a dissolution of neighborhood connectedness. And the number one thing that we can do to solve the disparity problem is to look at our neighborhoods and develop connections once again. That involves working with city school board to create neighborhood schools. That involves requiring those places with connection with the city to have adult, senior, and family recreation educational programs that says reaching out to our nonprofits and targeting their services into the neighborhoods in need. Not spreading them across the whole city as we do now, but making sure that we're meeting the needs of each individual neighborhood. And the last thing is working with our partners in health and saying to them, instead of building your satellite centers out in the suburbs where people have access to transportation, use our empty lots, use our burned down houses, build neighborhood centers where we can take our families and our, stu our students right down the street where we can all work together to build connectedness. And that's what's gonna decrease our disparity over time, is going and fixing the problem of community that we've created. We have about five minutes for audience questions, and we don't have an order, so whoever would like to answer that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and read this one. Um, describe the role, relationship, the University of Rochester and the city have, and how would you force that relationship as a city council member. Relationship with the U of R. You both already have mic, so fight for it. <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna fight for it, but I'm, I'm a graduate of the U of R. I'm an alum, so I'm in school MBA. Um, the U of R is the largest employer. It's an important resource in our community, and we've worked very hard um, going all the way back to the 1980s when we fought for the pedestrian bridge to connect the 19th Ward to the university, moving forward from there to actually get housing built on this side of the community. I think we have to live uh, in a way that allows us to coexist peacefully with the University of Rochester. We've gone from a situation where they were absolutely adamant against anybody on their campus coming to our side of the river. And we've moved away from that and we've made great progress to a point where we have students living over here on a regular basis. Uh, we started things like the bridge dinners and the, and the bridge brunch to connect with the university. And I think, you know, there are a number of us in the room. I see, I see Angie back there who's also a grad. I mean, there are a number of us here who either work, went to school there, taught there, uh, or have children there. So it's important that we work together with the university, but we have to work together in a way that they're not dictating what happens to us, but that we're dictating what we would like to have, and then we work together with them to help make it happen. Thank you. Uh, I'm also a University of Rochester alumni. I have my doctorate in leadership and policy from the Warner School. Um, one of the things that I think we need to take a look at is the fact that the university is not paying a fair amount of taxes. In comparison to the rest of the city, um, they are the largest employer. They're a huge landholder. They're not giving us the amount of money that they should be for the services they're receiving. As I sat with the firefighters last week during their endorsement conversations, which I received this week, um, they let us know that there is no fee paid by this, the University of Rochester for their fire services. That's not okay. We need to make sure that the university is paying for things like any plowing that's done, any water that's being provided. The services that we as taxpayers pay for as well, we need to turn around and make sure that the university is giving their fair share. All right, you guys have two more that would like to answer that, Mary and um, Mitch. Hi. Um, I live in the Plex neighborhood on um, South Plymouth and Magnolia, and we have a vibrant community in that area. And the University, the University of Rochester is a good thing for our community, but it's also encroaching on that neighborhood, and they've been trying to fight back for years and losing. The city needs to take the lead from the neighborhood of the development that they want. There's a beautiful nature patch over there, which 
is so special that it actually you don't feel like you're in the city. You feel like you're in the middle of the woods. And that's in danger of becoming high income housing, and that's not okay. We have enough of that in the city. The other issue is that the University of Rochester is not employing the people in the neighborhood who can get there by walking over that pedestrian bridge. And we really need to insist that they start in, in employing people that live here. Thanks. My name is Mitch Brewer, in case anyone didn't catch it the first time. Um, I just finished uh, an eight-year degree at the University of Rochester. I finished a PhD in history. And I taught there for a number of years, and I was shocked at the amount of students that come into this city and never even get it. And these are history students. They never even come over to the Susan B. Anthony house. They never even know that Susan B. Anthony spent the lion's share of her years here. How are we going to get students who spend three or four of their most important years of their lives in the city of Rochester to invest in this city. If we can't even get them to embrace the beautiful, amazing cultural traditions and history that we have here, we need to find a way to build a pipeline of those kids to the key cultural institutions of the city so that they love it. So that when they're ready to then be homeowners, and they're, when they're ready to start small businesses, they can do it right here in the city of Rochester. On top of that, I'd also say that the city has done, or uh, the U of R has done a, a nice job of encouraging homeownership of employees of the U of R, but in very specific neighborhoods. That needs to be diversified so we get some more income equality across neighborhoods. Thank you. Um, the U of R is a, is a great institution, but the U of R needs to be more lower income friendly, middle class friendly, meaning Develop programs that help our children get a trade. If you, if you don't want our children on, on, on the campus, take some of these buildings and sponsor trades. Sponsor programs that teach you plumbing, that teach you carpentry. It's good to go to college, but so many people out of college don't have a job. My goal is to partner with the city school district to make sure when you graduate, you not only have a diploma, you also are, are have a certification in a trade. And I strongly believe that the University of Rochester has the capabilities and the staffing and the money to offer that to our community. Thank you. Okay, we'll have to take this last point from Mr. Hall. Hello, my name is Dorian Hall, and this is very touching to me because the reason I'm running is because of the U of R. My neighborhood is called Plex. We're the neighborhood that is actually adjacent to the water, I mean to the, to the University of Rochester. And we have had an influx of issues where it comes to speculators coming in to buy property and displace people. We've had a bunch of issues where people coming in to just push out people because of the dollar bill, the dollar sign. The U of R is coming over the river and we're looking to, to get a hold of whatever we can. Which has led me to running for city council because I have a board here that has a bunch of information. I'm a finance guy and an IT guy. You can see the CDBG money where it was spent. You can see the roofing grant. You can see the investments of where people are, where the cities are doing investment. I spent since 2012, working with the community, became not for profit, and working to make sure the residents have a say. Currently, we don't, and this is the reason why I'm running for city council. So I would say the U of R needs to make sure they have a community tie-in with the community, with the, with the neighborhood. Thank you. On behalf of the Community Association, I would like to offer our sincere thanks to all of you as audience members for spending time tonight asking very profound questions, although we didn't get to all of your questions. Thank you to each and every one of the candidates for coming and spending this time with us. Very informed, you are all a wonderfully bright group of people. I wish you all the best of luck. Marcus C. Woods. <laughs> <laughs> On September 12th, the primary, November 1st.